It is now six o'clock p.m. South African time. A very warm welcome to everyone and thank you so much for joining us for lecture six of the Cricket South Africa Level 1 umpiring course hosted by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Abdullah Steenkamp and my co-presenter for today will be Tom Mokorosi. And again, we will have our special guest from the ICC International Council, Langton Ruzeri. Can, can I please, can I please ask everyone to mute the mics? Thank you so much. Our format for the lecture for this evening will be, we will be covering the nine dismissal modes. I will cover laws 32 till 37. I will then have a hand over to Tom, who will cover laws 38, 39 and 40. And you will also do a match preparation uh, uh, slides before we open the floor for Q&A. So to kick off this evening, the first dismissal law is the bold law. A law tell us that the striker will be out bold if the wicket is broken by the ball that was delivered by the bowler and not being a noble, even if the ball first touches the striker's bat or person. So the ball needs to be, needs to put the wicket down or broke the wicket for the striker to be out bold. However, striker will not be out bold if, if before striking the wicket, the ball has been in contact with any other player or umpire. Bold to take precedence, bold to supersede any other dismissal, bold is number one. If a striker or if there's more than one mode of dismissal of a single delivery and one of them is bold, bold will then supersede any other dismissal. Uh, court, let's look at a video. Fair catch. A catch shall be considered fair if the ball is held in a fielder's hand, hugged to the body of the catcher, or accidentally lodges in his or her clothing, helmet, or protective equipment. But of course, this being cricket, it isn't always that simple. If a fielder deliberately uses an item of clothing to try to catch the ball, it is not out and five penalty runs are awarded to the batting side. However, the ball can be caught after it has deflected off the other batsman, an umpire, another fielder, including off a helmet being worn, or even if it lodges in a fielder's helmet. Perhaps the main criterion for a catch to be considered fair is that the ball must not touch the ground before being caught. Here, for example, the ball does not touch the ground even though the hand holding it does so in affecting the catch. This is a fair catch. And then there is the question of catches near the boundary. This is such an interesting subject that we've given it a film all of its own. To catch up on everything to do with catching, simply refer to Law 33 in the Blue Book. Thank you, Tommy. Can runs be scored when a uh, batter is out caught? So, example, batter hits the ball very high up in the air, and before the catch is completed, the batters actually complete two runs. So can the runs be scored? Law tell us if a striker is dismissed, scored, no runs to be scored except runs for penalties. So no runs to be scored if a batter is out caught. In the previous law, we heard that the bold dismissal will be superior. So now law tell us if bold is number one, who is number two? You caught is number two. So if a, if a batter is not out bold, then in, if the batter is out caught, caught to take precedence. Caught will be number two, even if there is another 
uh, mode of dismissal for either batter. Let's look at a video or a catch that happened recently in the Ashes series between Australia and England. So we will listen to uh, feedback from Ricky Ponting and uh, Sir Alistair Strauss. Uh, we will then, after looking at the video and hearing their comments, we will then hear Mare Erasmus's feedback on the decision because he was the TV umpire that adjudicated on the decision. So let's first look at a clip, hear their comments, and then we'll listen to Mare's explanation of uh, why the batter was given not out. I want your opinion on that catch now, Ricky. You've had ages to digest it as you've meandered across the outfield. What do you reckon? And the last 10 minutes in the commentary box, we've been talking about it. <laughs> I, I'm worried about the inconsistencies of all of this. I mean, I can sit back and argue that Steve Smith wasn't in control of his movements either in the first innings. His was deemed to have his fingers underneath the ball. Mitchell Stark took the catch what, three or four feet from the ground. So at some stage, his finger was were underneath the ball. Well, I'm sure we'll get more. We'll talk about it forever. We'll get more clarification, I'm sure, overnight by the time we've spoken to the umpires. But, I mean, if you look at that, I know they're talking about the, the movement not being completed, but that's been held longer than any slips catch, any keeper's catch that's ever been taken in the history of the game. But they catch it and throw it up straight away, and sometimes you are still moving when you've done that. So I could argue that he's controlled that ball as long, if not longer, than most catches that are actually taken in the game. I suppose, and I'd say to, to Strauss here, I haven't asked, been able to ask Maria Erasmus specifically about this, but if he's arguing that he's not in control of his movements, it's because he's using his ball to, the ball to steady himself a wee bit. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's what he'll come back to. Um, but the was, Steve, was Steve Smith yeah. doing the same? I mean, that's what I don't... And I, I think what you'll see with a lot of these is you'll, you'll see different umpires interpret that in a different way, I reckon. Right. We'll have a look at the Steve Smith catch then, because you can go through what you mean about having his fingers on the ball and then his movements after. Yeah, well, this, I mean, I, I spoke to you this yes, night. Yeah. I, the, he, he clearly catches that a long way above the ground. And what he said then, if you look at the way his fingers were underneath the ball, on the bottom side of the ball, the ball then, from what angles that I saw, the ball actually touched the ground, although his fingers were underneath it. And As he came up. back up, the ball came out of his hand. So is he actually in control of the ball? I think Mitchell Stark was in the control of the ball longer than what Steve Smith was with his. The question I have, I mean, it's sloppy from Mitchell Stark, isn't it? I think the catch was good, but yeah. you don't let the ball just go along the ground like that. He could have easily sort of rolled his body over and made sure yeah. the ball did not touch the ground. Yeah, so it was a 100%. sloppy bit of fielding in the end. Yeah, I cannot argue with that at all. So let's uh, listen to Marie Rasmus's feedback, who was the TV umpire uh, when Mitchell Stark uh, took uh, the cats and let's listen to why Marie Rasmus gave, gave it not out. You exactly what you saw in the third umpire's chair and just get interpret the law for us as you with your thinking process around the cat. Yeah, the law is specific and it uh, says that the fielder has to have control of his body and movement. In that particular case, he was still moving and he put the ball on the ground. Now, if you take that um, example and say he was sliding towards the boundary, if he slid into the boundary, we would have deemed it either four or six, depending on if the ball touched the ground before. So there's no difference uh, in our interpretation for the catch. So the key thing is that he only then has control of his body when, when the movement has stopped. And by that stage, the ball has clearly touched the ground. Yes. It was actually quite simple because he actually put the ball uh, on the ground quite early um, and then eventually when he you know, came to stop, it was too late. The next dismissal law that we're covering is hit the ball twice. Let's look at a video that explains how this law works. Hit the ball twice. Hit the ball twice and you're out. Unless, of course, you're defending your wicket or it was accidental, in which case you're still in. The striker is out, hit the ball twice, if, while the ball is in play, it strikes any part of his person or is struck by his bat and, before the ball has been touched by a fielder, he willfully strikes it again with his bat or person. The key word here is willfully. 
But if this had happened instead, the batsman would remain in. In other words, inadvertent double strikes don't count. The batsman is allowed to hit the ball a second time in order to guard his wicket. He can use his bat or almost any part of his body. He cannot, however, use a hand that's not holding the bat. The only time you can't use your bat to hit the ball twice to defend your wicket is when it would prevent a catch. The batsman can also hit the ball a second time in order to return it to a fielder, as long as a fielder has given him permission to do so. If you'd like to swat up on this a bit more, simply turn to Law 34 in the Blue Book, where you'll find all the nitty-gritty detail you need. So can you score runs if you legally hit the ball a second time? We've just uh, seen in the video that you are allowed to legally hit the ball a second time, and that is only if you want to protect your wicket. That's the only time where you are legally allowed to hit the ball for a second time. So now you've hit the ball legally, you've now tried to protect your wicket, and you've hit the ball uh, so hard, uh, it now, let's say, it's going towards the boundary. Are runs permitted? Are you allowed to run yes or no? The law tell us, no, you're not allowed to run. So if you do legally hit the ball a second time, and let's say you hit it so hard, it goes over the boundary, that boundary will not count. As soon as the ball reaches the boundary or touches the boundary, I uh, umpire to call and signal dead ball. Or let's say you don't hit it that hard and, and you just hit it uh, past the inner ring, but you do take a single, the law tells us that upon the completion of the first run, then the umpire to call and signal dead ball. So you'll allow the batters to run. Yes, they're not allowed to run, but, you, uh, but you'll give the fielding side the opportunity to try to run out either of the batter, batters. And once they've completed the first run, only then you call and signal dead ball. So now let's say they've hit it uh, um, past the, uh, the inner circle and they decided to take a run. We've just heard that you need to call and signal dead ball as soon as they've completed the first run. What do you then do? You need to disallow all runs to the batting side. That run should not count. You will return any not out batter to his original end. If there was a no ball, at no ball, uh, to be applicable, and you will award any five penalty runs. There's one exception, the helmets belonging to the fielding side. If the ball should hit the helmet um, that was placed behind the keeper, those five penalty runs uh, shall not apply in this instance. Hit wicket. We're first going to cover uh, how you can be dismissed hit wicket. We're also going to cover how you not out hit wicket. So let's firstly look at how you can be dismissed hit wicket. And let's look at what is the window period for you to be given out hit wicket. So when does it start? When does it end? We'll first focus on when it starts. And then in two slides from now, I will show you when the hit wicket ends. So Lord tell us, the striker can be given out hit wicket if after the bowler has entered his or her delivery stride. So when does the delivery stride start? It starts when the back foot lands of the particular bowler. So now we've got a time frame. We now know when it starts. So from what moment the striker can be given out hit wicket. He tells us the bowler needs to have entered his or her delivery stride. So, so now we have when it starts. So what happens if your bowler, uh, if it happens before entering the delivery stride? We'll see in the next slide what you need to do. But the point I want to emphasize here is when it starts, and it starts once the bowler has entered his or her delivery stride. And now, so now the bowler has entered his or delivery stride, and then the wicket is put down by either the striker's bat or person or in any other circumstances. 
So let's go through the various points, how you can be out eat wicket. First point tells us, so after the bowler has entered his delivery stride, any course or the course of any action taken by the striker in preparing to receive or in receiving a delivery. Example of this, you'll often find uh, a batter's uh, the part of the trigger movement is either um, going uh, back and across. That's a trigger movement that I had when I played the game uh, many years ago. Uh, you'll sometimes find uh, batters um, having the bat on the ground. And as the bowler is uh, uh, coming closer to delivering the ball, uh, the batter will then lift up the bat in facing the delivery. These are just examples of the action that a striker uh, can take in preparing to receive the delivery. So now, this is now point number one. So any course, that the, any action that the striker takes, whether it's back and across, lifting the bat, and if the and if by by taking that action, let's say moving back and across, and the striker then let's say uh, let's say tramps on the wicket, striker should be given out hit wicket. But remember, there is a starting point for this. It must happen when only when the bowl is entered his or her delivery stride. Also, the striker will be out hit wicket in setting off for the first run. And a very important word in this sentence is it needs to be immediately after playing uh, at the ball. So the striker will be out hit wicket in setting off for the first run immediately. It needs to be immediately. The striker plays the ball into the covers immediately, then setting off for the first run. The striker then tramps on uh, his or wicket. Then the striker should be given out hit wicket. But again, important word is it needs to be immediately. If it's not immediately, if there is a pause, an example of this, striker hits the ball into the covers. The striker then first want to check whether the ball goes past the middle fielder. The striker shouts, wait, 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 wait. And then the striker now sets off. If in that case, the striker then tramps on his or her thumbs, that will be not out hit wicket. We'll get to it in, in two slides time, but I'm just giving an example of immediately. It needs to happen immediately. There shouldn't be a, a pause in when the striker sets off for his or her first run. So in point number two, the striker plays at the ball and now runs. In, in point number three, is exactly the same as point number two. Just in this case, the striker did not attempt to play at the ball, but the striker still sets off for a run. Let's say the striker shoulders arms it, uh, and the keeper then misses it. And now the striker wants to set up for the first run. Same principle applies. It needs to be if no shot was played and the, and the batters do decide to run for the striker to be given out the wicket in setting off for that first run. It needs to be immediately. Striker will also be out the wicket. If in lawfully making a second or further stroke while the striker is guarding his or her wicket. Those are the instances where the striker will be given out hit wicket. Earlier I mentioned that when does it start? When does that window period uh, open for the striker to be given out hit wicket? It must be when the back foot lands, when the, once the bowlers enter his or her delivery stride. So what happens if it uh, if the wicket is put down by the striker before the bowler has entered his delivery stride, i.e. before the bowler has, um, has entered his or um, her delivery stride? If it happens before, either umpire to call and signal dead ball. So when will the striker be not out hit wicket? This point number one, and in point then bullet point number one, I'm going to focus when that window period closes. In the previous slide, we've heard the window period opens when the back foot lands. It closes after the striker has completed any action in receiving that delivery. So once the shot is completed, once the action for that particular shot is completed, then the window period closes. So a striker can only be given out hit wicket 
it opens when the delivery when uh, once the the back foot lands and it closes after the striker has completed the sort of completed any action in receiving the delivery if it happens after the shot is done uh should be not out it wicket also not out it wicket if in the act of running other than setting off immediately for the first run so let's say this uh, the striker plays the ball into the covers set up for the, uh, the first run completed uh, turns for the second now goes for the third and now the stri striker with let's say either the bat or the foot uh, put the wicket down in this case law tell us this is not out it wicket it needs to happen in that first run immediately after playing uh, um, at the ball after that not out it wicket also striker will be not out it wicket if it occurs when the striker is trying to avoid being run out or stumped Also, not out it wicket when the striker is trying to avoid a throw at any time. Also, not out it wicket if the bowler, after entering his or her delivery stride, the bowler then does not deliver the ball. Also, not out it wicket. And lastly, if the delivery is a no ball, also not out it wicket. Let's look at a video that happened in an uh, international game a year or two ago. And what I want you to do is, I'm not going to play the full video. I'm going to play a portion of the video. I'm going to pause it. I'm going to play the video again. And I want you to put in the chat box uh, whether, uh, the, uh, whether you'll give the striker out or not out. And just give a small reason next to your out or not out why you say out or not out. So let's look at the video at the, fir uh, the first time. Again, I'm just going to play a portion of the video. Well, ball. Yeah, that's what can happen when you set and you think the pitch is behaving very nicely. End of the over. Now, what has happened here? Well, has he uh, has he uh, somehow touched the uh, stumps? Uh, what's what's going on here? One now, of the Brendan players... Taylor, I think, after he's played the shot, has knocked the bales off with his bat. Now, I didn't see what was happening. I just heard it in my ear. And uh, Shaki Balasan has gone and uh, appealed to Maria Rasmus. So, discussion going on between those two men. Interesting to see what happened here, actually. Well, he's just uh, checking with the uh, fielders. And we're not too sure, but the bales were off. One of the bail. Let's see what has happened. He's fine. It's a legal delivery. It'll be a big blow if uh, Brendan Taylor departs in that fashion nothing 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 what does he do oops that's gone i'm gonna play it again i want you to look at it again and and then put your answer in the chat box with a small reason we will discuss uh the answers in our q a session so yeah it goes again again i'm just going to play a portion of the wicket i'm not going to play the f portion of the uh, clip i'm not going to play it fully through Well, yeah, that's what can happen when you set and you think the pitch is behaving very nicely. End of the over. Now, what has happened here? Well, has he uh, has he uh, somehow touched the stumps? Uh, what's what's going on here? One now, of the Brendan bales... Taylor, I think, after he's played the shot, has knocked the bales off with his bat. Now, I didn't see what was happening. I just heard it in my ear. And uh, Shaki Balasan has gone and uh, appealed to 
Maria Erasmus. So, discussion going on between those two men. Be interesting to see what happened here, actually. Well, he's just uh, checking with the uh, fielders. And we're not too sure, but the bales were off. One of the bail. Let's see what has happened. He's fine. It's a legal delivery. It'll be a big blow if uh, Brendan Taylor de departs in that fashion. Nothing, nothing, nothing. What does he do? Oops, that's gone. Looking forward to seeing your your decisions in the chat box. We'll get to it later on in our Q&A session. Next law is leg before wicket. Let's look at a video first. Leg before wicket. LBW. LBW is a little like the offside rule in football. Many people claim to know it, but how many people really do? Our handy checklist means that whether you find yourself umpiring an international test match or the kids on the beach, your reputation for fairness will remain intact. There are five basic criteria to consider. The batsman is out, leg before wicket, if one, the bowler bowls a ball that isn't a no ball, unlike this poor fellow. Two, the ball, if it is not intercepted on the full, pitches in line between wicket and wicket or on the offside of the batsman's wicket. It cannot be out if the ball pitches outside the line of the leg stump. Three, the ball hits the batsman either full pitch or after pitching and before he hits it with his bat. Four, ah, this is where it gets a bit more complicated. If the batsman was making a genuine attempt to play the ball, the point of impact must be between wicket and wicket for LBW to be an option. However, if the batsman has made no genuine attempt to play the ball, the contact must either be between wicket and wicket or outside the line of the off stump. Five, this is the crucial part. But for the interception by the batsman, the ball would have gone on to hit the stumps and dislodge the bales. Any questions? Just refer to Law 36 in the Blue Book. So let's sum summarize what the video is saying about LBW. Firstly, ball should not be a no ball. If not intercepted on the full, the ball either needs to pit in line between wicket and wicket or on the offside of the wicket. So either in line or on the offside. That's why if it pitches outside leg stump, will always be not out. If it pits outside leg stump. Should not have touched the bat first of the batter. So if it makes contact with the bat first, not out LBW. But if it makes contact with the pad first and then the bat, then you can consider the LBW. There are other points that you also need to take into account, but the point I'm trying to make here is if it touches the, the pad or the person first and then the bat, then you can consider the, LB, the, the LBW. But if, uh, but if it touches the bat first, the, it will always then be not out. Striker intercepts the ball with any part of his or her person. Yes, I know it's LBW, leg before wicket, uh, but Lord tell us it can strike any part of the person, whether it's the arm, the, the stomach, any part, uh, you can consider it. Now the law wants the point of impact to be between wicket and wicket. Point of impact should always be between wicket and wicket. There's one but, and then th that one but is if the striker made no 
genuine attempt to play at the ball with his or her bat. And if there's been no genuine attempt to play the ball with the bat, uh, then the impact can then either be between wicket and wicket, or it can be on the offside of the wicket. And then lastly, you, the ball would have gone on to hit the wicket. Let's look at a few uh, pictures and apply these five bullet points that you need to consider when there's an LBW uh, appeal. A right-handed batter. So when considering an LBW appeal, what do you look for? And let's assume it's not a no ball. And let's assume in all the pictures, there's no contact with the uh, with with the bat. So, where did it pitch? Uh, Albert, uh, LBW law wants it to pitch on pitch uh, between wicket and wicket, or on the offside of the wicket. Where did this ball pitch? For this right-handed batter, it pitch outside leg stump. That's why this will never be out LBW. This pick, where did it pitch? Did it pitch between the wicket and wicket or on the offside of the wicket? Yes, it pitched between uh, wicket and uh, wicket. Where was the impact? Was the impact between wicket and wicket? Yes, the impact was between wicket and wicket. What is the last point that you need to consider? Would it have gone on to hit the stumps? And that is where you need to make your judgment call. If your opinion, this would have gone on to hit the stumps, give the batter out LBW. If in your opinion, it would not have gone on to hit the stumps, you can give the batter not out LBW. Again, let's go through our points. Where did it pitch? Did it pitch between wicket and wicket or on the offside of the wicket? Yes, it pitched on the offside of the wicket. Let's look at the impact. Where was the impact? Was the impact between wicket and wicket? No, the impact was not between wicket and wicket. And because the impact is not between wicket and wicket, or another way of saying this, the impact impact was outside off stump, or the impact was outside the line. And because the batter in playing a shot with the impact not between being between wicket and wicket, or impact being outside the line, that's why this will not be out LBW. Again, let's go through our process. Where did it pitch? Did it pitch between the wicket and wicket or on the offside? Yes, it pitched on the offside. Next, let's look at the impact. Was the impact between wicket and wicket? No, the impact was not between wicket and wicket. But remember, I said to you there was a but. The but was if there was no attempt to play at the ball by the striker, even if the impact is outside, uh, not between wicket and wicket, or if the impact is outside the line or outside off stump, you then can consider the LBW appeal. So in this scenario, yes, the impact was not between wicket and wicket, but you can consider it because the striker did not play, uh, uh, attempt to play at the ball. So then you just need to apply the last point in the LBW law. In your opinion, would this ball have gone on to hit the wicket? If the answer to that question is yes, give the striker out LBW. If the answer to that question is no, I don't think this ball would have gone on to hit the wicket, then your answer to the appeal will be not out. Again, let's go through our process. And uh, yes, our process do have five points, but uh, with experience and in your brain, these five points actually uh, goes through your brain in, in, in milli, milli, uh, milliseconds. It goes quickly through your brain while you process all the information. I'm just going, it, going through it uh, much slower um, for the purpose of um, explaining the LBW law. So... Where did it pitch? Did it pitch uh, between wicket and wicket or, or on the offside of the wicket? Yes, it pitched in line with the wicket. Where was the impact? Was the impact between wicket and wicket? Yes, the impact was between wicket and wicket. What is the last point that you need to consider? Would, in your opinion, this would have gone on to hit the stumps? If your answer to that question is yes, give the striker out LBW. If the answer to that question is no, then 
your answer to the appeal will be not out. Again, let's go through our process. Did it pit between wicket and wicket or on the offside of the wicket? Yes, it pits between wicket and wicket. Where was the impact? Was it between wicket and wicket? Yes, the impact was between wicket and wicket. Would this have gone on to eat the stumps? That's the judgment call that uh, you need to, uh, to make. And for me, this looks like this is a left arm uh, bowler that's bowling over the wicket to a to this right-handed batter. So where the ball pits, it just pits in line. Where did it hit? Yes, it hit in line. But if you look at the trajectory of this ball, if you look at the angle of this ball, and if you look at the stride that the striker uh, got in, uh, we know the pop increase is 1.22 meters from the, the stumps. And if you, if you look at this uh, small, I wouldn't say it's a big stride, but if you look at uh, this stride, it will probably uh, be uh, 1.5 meters from the stumps. So now this ball still needs to travel 1.5 meters. So if you look at the angle of the ball, uh, when it hits, I don't think this is going to hit the stumps. The angle is taking this pass off stump. Again, that's my judgment call. If your judgment call is you think this would have gone on to hit the wicket, you give the striker out LBW. But you need to take all the information at your disposal to make your LBW decision. And the information that uh, I took into account, you know, for me, and it looks like this is left arm over the wicket bowler. And looking at the angle, I think this is missing off stump. But that's my opinion. Again, let's go through our process. Where did it pitch? Did it pitch on the offside or uh, between wicket and wicket? Yes, it pitched on the offside. Where was the impact? Was the impact between wicket and wicket? Yes, the impact was between wicket and wicket. What is that final step? You need to decide, would this ball have gone on to eat the wicket? So for me, looking at where it pitched, it then came back, looking at where it hit. Again, uh, the little stride that the striker is uh, uh, playing forward. We know the pop increase is 1.22 uh, meters from, from the stumps. So this, again, is about 1.5 meters from the stumps when the, uh, when the, impact, when the ball made uh, impact with the pad. So there's quite a bit of traveling distance. So again, looking at the angles, in my opinion, this would have gone on to miss the leg stump. But again, it's your opinion. And again, you need to take, you apply the law, but there's also other factors that you need to take into account uh, when uh, coming to a conclusion whether out LBW or not out LBW. So the factor that I took into account here is where the ball pitched, how much the ball came back, um, and where did the, the, the striker, it hit him between wicket and wicket, but the traveling distance is about 1.5 meters still to go. I think this is missing leg stump. Again, let's go through our process. Where did it pitch? Did it pitch between wicket and wicket or on the offside? Yes, it pitched on the offside. Where was the impact? Was the impact between wicket and wicket? Yes, the impact was between uh, wicket and uh, wicket. Would it have gone on to hit the stumps? So my judgment call, looking at where it pits, looking at the stride that the batter got forward, looking at where it hit the, the batter on the pad, looks, uh, looks high to me. So my opinion is that this is going over the top of the stumps. Last law that I'm covering for this evening before I hand over to Tom. Obstructing the field, let's start by looking at a video. Obstructing the field. A batsman is out obstructing the field if he or she willfully attempts to obstruct or distract the fielding side by word or action. Like this, for example. Thank you, Tommy. In particular, it is considered to be obstruction if, while the ball is in play and after the striker has played the ball, 
Either batsman willfully strikes the ball with a hand not holding the bat or any other part of his or her person or with the bat. The exception to this is when the batsman is attempting to defend his or her wicket. The batsman may do this with the bat or any part of his or her person except with a hand not holding the bat. If the batsman uses such a hand, he or she will be out obstructing the field. The handled the ball law no longer exists, with such incidents now covered by obstructing the field instead. The obstruction has to be willful. Accidental obstruction or obstruction caused by trying to avoid injury does not count, and the decision on that is down to the umpire. It's worth noting that if a catch is obstructed, it is the striker who is out, even if it was the non-striker who caused the obstruction. Mind you, it's not always an easy decision. Here, the batsman deliberately crosses out of the legal running area in order to attempt to obstruct a throw. There is no other reason why the batsman should be running across the pitch. What looked an accident was, in fact, an illegal incident. To avoid any possible confusion, read Law 37 in black and white in the blue book. Let's look at a video of an obstructing the field incident that happened a few years ago between uh, the Proteas and um, England in a one day international. Oh, danger, danger. Now then, what have they done here? Dead ball, called dead ball. They fired up South Africa. Now he's called dead ball to sort out the issue. Well, he's gone across to the other side of the pitch and that'll be something umpires will take into consideration. He's on one side, gets over the other side. He's not looking at the ball, the ball strikes him. Would he have got in? He was looking at the ball initially though, wasn't he? Wants the single, Livingston calls him back. At this point, Roy gets across to the other side and he is watching the ball. But whether you can say he's got himself deliberately between the ball and the stumps, I'm not sure. Come on, umpire Lloyd. And it's Jason Roy. Well, it's Jason Roy who's disappointed and the crowd as well. A ring of boos goes around the ground, but I'm sure the third umpire has given him out because Roy has crossed paths. He's got over to the other side of the pitch, got himself between ball and stumps, and in the third umpire's opinion, he's done that deliberately. So Roy's innings, a very good innings, comes to an end, 67 from 45, 133 for three. Let's see how the law looks at how runs are scored when a batter is dismissed obstructing the field. I'll start with point number two first. Law tell us that if the obstruction or distraction prevents the striker from bringing out court, any runs completed by the batter shall not be scored. Although any ru penalty runs awarded to either side shall stand. So if the obstruction prevents a catch from being taken, no runs to be scored. So now going to point number one. If the obstruction does not prevent a catch from being scored, runs any runs completed by the batters before the offence to be scored, together with any one-run penalty for noble or wide or any other award of five penalty runs to either side. And for this type of dismissal, Poland not to get credit. Tom, that is my portion for this evening. I'm now handing over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Abdullah, and good evening to you and all the candidates. Let me share my screen and we shall get going with laws 38, 39 and 40.
Row 38 is the runout. And let's first look at the definition of a runout. Either batter is run out, except as in law 38.2, which we shall see on the next slide. If at any time while the ball is in play, he or she is out of his or her ground and his or her wicket is fairly put down by the action of a fielder. So pretty straightforward definition, and I'm sure we've all seen a run out and know what it looks like. A run out can happen even though a no ball has been called and whether or not a run is being attempted. So we've looked at when a batter is out run out. Now let's look at when a batter is not out run out. The law tells us that a batter will not be out run out if he or she has been within his or her ground and has subsequently left it to avoid injury when the wicket is put down. So let's imagine a batter hits a ball to deep extra cover and runs through for a single and makes his or her ground comfortably at the opposite end with his or her bat grounded comfortably beyond the popping crease. And then the a bullet throw comes in from the fielder. And it seems as though the striker is going to be hit by the ball. So the striker takes evasive action and in doing so moves out of his or her crease and the ball hits the stumps and the wicket is broken fairly while with the batter out of his or her ground. So law is protecting this batter from being dismissed in that fashion because he or she has subsequently left her ground to avoid injury when the wicket was put down. Uh, I've never seen an example of that. Um, if you have, please share the link of a YouTube video for us. A batter is also not out run out if the ball has not subsequently touched a fielder after the bowler has entered the delivery stride before the wicket is put down. So here I have had an example of this in a match uh, about five years ago. It was only my second four day match as a Cricket South Africa first class panel umpire. It was the Warriors at home in Port Elizabeth against the visitors who were the Dolphins. And the Dolphins were bowling and uh, the batter Yasin Fali, the striker Yasin Fali, hit the ball quite powerfully at his partner, Lesiba Mwepe. Uh, Lesiba, as a good non-striker should do, was backing up outside of his crease at the non-striker's end and to avoid the ball from hitting him, he moved. And as he moved, the ball hit his bat. And from his bat, the ball hit the wickets at the non-striker's end. And he was out of his crease. The bowler, uh, Freilink, did not at any point touch the ball after he had delivered it. And so there was an appeal and I was very confused and nervous. I'd never seen anything like this before and I didn't know my laws as well as I should do. I knew that there had to be a intervention by another player to affect a run out because we all know that if a batter hits the ball straight down to the stumps at the non-striker's end without any contact from anyone, then the non-striker will not be outrun out. But now I wasn't sure if that 
impact of the ball hitting the non-striker's bat before putting the wicket down uh, would result in a run out. So I incorrectly gave uh, Lisiba Mwepe out. Um, he was not very happy about it and he stood. And that's when my partner, thankfully, came to my rescue and walked towards me from uh, his position at uh, square leg, the striker's end umpire. And he asked me if the bowler had got a touch on the ball, and I, which I said no. And then he said, uh, then it should not be out. And um, remember, we don't consult on every decision, uh, but I think it was a good thing that my partner consulted with me because it was a clear and obvious error. And I had to do my first and so far only one of these um, to change my decision of out to not out. Um, so I implore all of you to learn your laws, get to know them such that they are second nature to you. And when you are in a pressure situation, your brain can find that law that's relevant to the scenario and you be able to give the correct decision. OK, so the law tells us here that the ball, if it is not subsequently touched by a fielder after the bowler has entered the delivery stride and before the wicket is put down, then the batter shall be not out, run out. OK, so the correct decision in my scenario was not out. Because the ball had only hit the non strikers bat and not a fielder. More examples of a batter not out run out. Let's see what the law says. If a batter is out stumped, then they will not be out run out because you can only be out in one fashion. If no ball has been called and the striker is out of his or her ground but not attempting a run and the wicket is fairly put down by the wicket keeper without the intervention of another fielder then the striker will be not out run out uh, remember that in law 21 no ball abdullah covered the ways that you can be out of a no ball it is hit wicket, obstructing the field, and run out. You cannot be out stumped off a no ball. And what the law is saying here is that if a batter attempts to play a shot, possibly the striker has double stepped out of his or her crease, missed the ball, but once he or she has missed the ball, they do not attempt to run. They are stumped by the wicket keeper. If that delivery is a no ball, then the striker is not out stumped because you cannot be out stumped off a no ball. And also because the striker did not attempt a run, they are also protected from being out run out. So not out stumped and not out run out. This the important part of this law is that there was no intervention by another fielder. If the wicket keeper heard the call of no ball and saw that the striker was still out of his or her crease, the wicket keeper can pass the ball on to the first slip fielder and the first slip fielder would be able to affect the run out. But if there is no intervention from any other fielder, in this scenario where a bowler bowls a no ball and the striker double steps out of his or her crease, misses the ball, the striker cannot be out stumped and cannot be out run out by the wicket keeper. Let's have a look at an interesting run out appeal from the Ashes. Uh, Abdullah has shown us this evening, an incident surrounding catches. 
during the Ashes. We also had uh, an interesting run-out appeal, which was very well handled by TV umpire Nitin from India. Let's have a look, see why Steve Smith was given not out run out in what looked initially like it was going to be given out run out. Hey everyone, welcome back to Hit Wicket. If you're not a, a subscriber, consider liking the video or subscribing to help us grow as a channel. Now on to today's video. What could be a vital moment in the test and crucial to whether the series ends 2-2 occurred in the 78th over when Smith on 42 took on the arm of substitute George Elam, the son of former England all-rounder Mark, who sprinted in from deep mid-wicket and produced a rocket-like throw which was collected by Johnny Bairstow. Initially, it appeared that Smith was short of his ground, and with Ricky Ponting on Sky Sports commentary mentions of Gary Pratt soon followed. But on subsequent replays, umpire Knight and Menon ruled that the bale was not completely dislodged from both grooves until Smith, who had pulled out a full-length dive, was in his crease. There was also debate about whether Bairstow had dislodged the stumps fractionally before taking the ball. Under the laws, the bale has to be completely removed. Law 29.1 states, The wicket is broken when at least one bale is completely removed from the top of the stumps, or one or more stumps is removed from the ground. Tom Smith's Cricket Umpiring and Scoring, MCC's official interpretation of the laws of cricket adds, For the purposes of dismissal, a bale has been removed at the moment that both ends of it leave their grooves. The key words here being completely removed. As you can see from the replays, the bales have clearly been partially dislodged, but neither bale has been completely dislodged until after Smith has already made his ground. This is why the decision was given not out, which all things considered, was the right call. The dive effort from Smith and lack of awareness from Bairstow can also definitely attribute to the final decision. Let me know in the comments below if you thought the correct decision was made and how much of an impact could that decision have on this game. And until next time, I'll see you guys later. What's important there is judging a run out. Langton did mention on Tuesday that we need to focus on the pop increase. That is the only stationary element in the picture. And you need to also make sure that your head is dead still when making the decision. Um, I'm sure you all have phones that have cameras on them. If you try and take a picture while uh, moving, then the picture will be blurred. That's why in the same way, your vision will be uh, blurred if you are still moving as you try and make a decision. So uh, get yourself in a nice comfortable position. If you are at bowler's end, try and make sure you get to in line with the pop increase. Uh, stand still as the throw comes in. Um, crouch if you want to, to show your concentration and your focus on the pop increase, but make sure your head and body are still when you make the decision and watch the pop increase and your peripheral vision will help you to see when the wicket is put down. If you cannot see if the wicket is put down fairly because maybe the bowler is in your way, then you may consult with your partner to check whether the wicket was put down fairly or not. You do not ask your partner if he or she thinks the batter had made their ground. Uh, that is your decision alone to make, uh, but your partner can help you decide whether the wicket was put down fairly if your view of the wicket being put down was obstructed. Next in the run out law, we move on to a very contentious topic. 
the non-striker leaving his or her ground early? Is the bowler allowed to run the non-striker out before delivering the ball? Let's see what the law says. The law says that if the non-striker is out of his or her ground at any time from the moment the ball comes into play, okay, so that's when the bowler starts his or her run-up, until the instant when the bowler would normally have been expected to release the ball, okay? And that is the end of the bowler's delivery stride when they are up there at the release point. So that is the window period that the bowler is allowed to run out the non-striker. Abdullah spoke about a window period where a hit wicket dismissal can take place. There is a different window period for when a running out of the non-striker by a bowler may take place. So this starts when the bowler starts his or her run up and it ends when the bowler would normally have been expected to release the ball. So the release point at the top of his or her bowling action. So in that window period, if the non-striker is out of his or her ground, the non-striker will be liable to be run out. In these circumstances, the non-striker will be out run out if he or she is out of his or her ground when his or her wicket is broken by the bowler either throwing the ball at the wicket or by the bowler's hand holding the ball, breaking the wicket. And whether or not the ball is subsequently delivered uh, does not matter. I'm sure you will all know that this used to be and still is a contentious mode of dismissal. It was previously under Law 41, unfair play, but the lawmakers felt that they wanted to put the onus on the non-striker to make sure they remain within their crease until such time that the ball leaves the bowler's hand. Um, so it is now not seen as um, unfair for the bowler to attempt to run out the non-striker. Let's have a look at an animation describing what is famously known as a mancad dismissal. Running out the non-striker. Running out the non-striker occurs when a bowler runs out a batsman who has strayed too early out of the popping crease by removing the bales. It is a much debated form of dismissal, with some suggesting that a warning should be given. However, leaving his or her ground early is an attempt by the non-striker to gain an unfair advantage, and it puts a batsman at risk of getting out. The law doesn't require the bowler to give a warning, and he or she is entitled to run out the non-striker until the moment when he or she would normally have been expected to release the ball, in which case it's perfectly fair for the bowler to run the non-striker out. For more detail on this perfectly legal practice, see Law 4116 in the MCC's The Laws of Cricket. As mentioned, this dismissal was previously under law 41.16, as in the video. This is an old video. Um, the same law still exists, but has been moved now into the runout. Now let's have a look at two runouts of non-strikers. The first one, is a ladies match between India and England. And then the second one is from a men's Big Bash League match. And the first one is a correct execution of running out of the non-striker. Let's watch Deepti Sharma in action. 
No. I'm not so sure. I know it's in the laws of the game. Decision for the big screen. So the decision here from the TV umpire was out. It did not go down well with the home supporters of England, but it was technically the correct decision because Dipti Sharma did not reach the point of release. I will play it and you will see that her bowling arm has not extended vertically. And when she lands, the non striker is a couple of feet out of her ground. So unlucky for the non striker, but actually, some would say um, a little bit unaware. And it's quite often that non-strikers are not attempting to steal ground, but they need to watch the bowler release the ball before they leave their crease. As simple as that. Um, a little bit of field craft. You cannot warn every batter on every delivery if they are continually leaving their non-strikers crease early. Um, but I do, if I see a non-striker uh, without looking at the bowler, leaving his or her ground early, I do have a quiet word to them and say to them, um, just note that you are leaving the crease before the bowler has bowled the ball. And the bowler can run you out and does not need to give you a warning for me to give you out. So I've found that once I give that friendly word of warning to non-strikers, they then start watching the bowler uh, release their delivery before they leave their crease. Next example is Adam Zampa attempting to run out the non-striker, but he doesn't know the law, so he made a complete hash of it. Let's see what transpired. Third umpire director, got a review for run out. We want to check whether the bowler's arm has gone past the vertical. That's uh, satisfy the law for run out at the bowler's end. Yeah, this oh is boy. critical because that's actually correct. Yeah. So once you the back foot is where most people roll it through, roll it through, roll it through, roll it through, and roll it through further. Now his arm's gone past the vertical, therefore not out. Repeat. Decision for the big screen will be not out. I'll tell you what, that's Sean Craig in the hot seat, mm. and that's a very interesting decision. The right call from the umpire. Yeah. Well, the bowling arm has gone through the vertical, and that is why Adam Zampa's attempt at running out the non-striker was correctly given not out by the TV umpire. Now, in club cricket, we do not have the luxury of TV umpires, so we need to make that decision on field as to whether the non-striker is out or not out, run out by the bowler. And uh, good umpiring practice is to consult with your striker's end umpire because he or she is quite often in a better position than you are to see whether the bowler had gone past the vertical or not. Why? Because you should be watching the bowler's feet. 
the back foot landing and the front foot landing to judge uh, whether it's a fair delivery or not in terms of where the feet have landed. And you might not be 100% sure as to whether the arm reached the vertical or not before the run out attempt of the non-striker was made. So get together with your strikers and umpire. And also during that walk from your position at bowler's end towards your partner at striker's end, this is not allowed in international cricket. Umpires are not allowed to ask the fielding captain if they would like to go ahead with the appeal or if they would prefer to withdraw their appeal. But in club cricket, in Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, we encourage umpires just to ask the fielding captain before the two umpires get together. Captain, are you happy to go ahead with this appeal or do you want to consider withdrawing it? And just say that as you're walking towards your partner, no need to make a big scene about it. It will give the captain time while you are deliberating with your partner. It will give the captain time to decide whether they want to withdraw that appeal or not. But remember what I said in the first lecture, do not force the fielding captain to withdraw his or her team's appeal. Second last law for tonight is stumped. We've got another animation video for you. Let's see what this looks like. Stumped. All batsmen fear being stumped and all wicket keepers dream of stumping batsmen. So let's be clear about the law. The only player who can stump a batsman is this fellow, the wicket keeper. A stumping can take place provided that the ball is not a no ball. You can be stumped off a wide, however. Here, for example, the batsman has moved out of his or her ground to play the ball, but has missed it and has not attempted a run. The wicket is fairly put down by the wicket keeper without the intervention of another fielder. When all these conditions are met, the batsman will find that he or she has indeed been stumped. It's also okay for the ball to rebound onto the stumps off any part of the wicket keeper, including his or her protective equipment or helmet. If it is a no ball, the batsman will not be out stumped and is also protected from being run out as long as he or she is not attempting a run. Don't be stumped about stumping. Get a copy of the Blue Book and study Law 39. Last law for tonight, a reminder that there are 42 laws in the law book. However, law 41 and law 42 are not examined in Cricket South Africa's level one exam, so we shall not be covering them. We cover them in detail in level two as well as level three. They are, however, in this presentation, so you should all have a copy of this presentation by now. It was on the email that I sent yesterday with a link to all the recordings of all the lectures so far. Law 40 is <clears throat> timed out. When is a batter out timed out? After the fall of a wicket or the retirement of a batter, the incoming batter must unless time has been called, be ready to receive the ball or for the other batter to receive the next ball within three minutes of the dismissal or retirement of the previous batter. If this retirement is not met, upon appeal, the incoming batter will be given out, timed out. Very important to find out 
from the incoming batter who is late before you give your decision why is that incoming batter late i've had it before where a team was batting with only two sets of pads amongst the whole team so every time a batter went out then the incoming batter would need to use the pads of the outgoing batter and that obviously takes time so that is the reason why that batter took longer than three minutes to get to the crease uh, infamously uh, Sachin Tendulkar once took more than three minutes to get to the crease at Newlands Cricket Ground when playing against South Africa. South Africa did not appeal. Um, I think they were too uh, scared of the repercussions of um, getting Sachin Tendulkar out timed out. And it is always going to be called out as against the spirit of cricket if a team appeals for a timed out wicket. However, it is in the law and the law is pretty clear that a new batter needs to be ready to face or if the batter who's not out is facing the next delivery, then that next batter should face the next delivery within three minutes. Uh, it is clear for all to see. It's a very straightforward law. And the last thing we need to know about it is that a bowler does not get credit for a batter being out, timed out. So please don't make a scene and don't let the game be all about you and give a batter out, timed out. Find out the reasons and if there are wholly acceptable reasons why the batter is only ready after three minutes to face uh, the next delivery, uh, then you can turn the appeal down, say not out, and um, give that wholly acceptable reason as your reason for not giving the better out. You will be criticized by the fielding team, but um, this is one place where uh, you as an umpire can um, make your decision uh, based on circumstances uh, a little bit outside of the law. So that is all the laws we are presenting to you. Uh, but remember that we want you after this course to be ready to umpire your first match if you are not yet umpiring. So what we've got before we go into our question and answer session is a match preparation presentation, which I shall take you through now. So, what do we have in our match preparation presentation? We've got three topics to discuss, the dress code of an umpire, the equipment that an umpire needs to carry both on his or her person as well as in his or her kit bag. And then the pre-match duties on the morning of a match. What do those look like? So let's start off with the dress code. And I always say to new umpires, the easiest thing to get right in umpiring is your dress code. Apologies, I'm just going to reduce this picture so that we see all the text on the slide. And then I will reshare my screen. So the picture at the bottom is uh, two very established umpires. Kumar Darnasina and Alim Da. Alim Da has recently stepped down off the ICC elite panel of umpires. Um, 
but I think holds the records for the most international number of matches umpired in all formats. You can see that they uh, look identical in terms of their uniform. They are neat and they are also comfortable in the attire that they are wearing and are able to carry out their duties well and professionally. So, sponsored hat or cap in Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, we do supply hats and caps uh, with our branding on them. Uh, if you have, if you wear a headband under your cap or your hat, uh, or the ICC headband there, for example, um, if you have a Western Province one or whichever association you're representing, make sure that that headband is clean. Make sure your shirt is ironed and clean. And if you are going to wear a vest it, and you are wearing a white standing shirt, make sure the vest is also white. Your black pants need to be formal pants. Um, a few umpires asked me when they were starting off if they could wear chinos. Uh, chinos are too informal and they also fade very quickly. Um, and they're also heavier than formal pants. Uh, you don't want to be standing in heavy pants um, for eight hours in the sun. So comfortable fitting black formal pants. And if you've got the budget to do so, tailor your pants so that uh, you look um, strong in your body language and also um, neat and tidy. The shoes that we wear for club cricket, if we are wearing a white standing shirt, would be white running shoes. I say running shoes because those are the most comfortable and they offer the most support. Do yourself a favor, invest in a good pair of running shoes, not just any old cheap ones, uh, because they are protecting your feet, which you will be standing on for hours on end, weekend after weekend after weekend. When it comes to watches, belts and sunglasses, please, guys, nothing flashy that will draw attention to you. Um, also, be careful that um, if the sun shines on your sunglasses, that they that your sunglasses don't uh, reflect um, into the batter's um, vision. Uh, that can be a distraction to them if you've got uh, fancy, flashy sunglasses. What equipment do you need on field? And we do have pictures of some of these items on the next slide. Uh, quite importantly, you need to have a clicker that you count your deliveries with. Uh, you need to have a bowling card that you keep track of who has bowled how many overs. You need to have a pen and some will say a spare pen to make sure that you are able to write throughout the game. Uh, a bowler's marker is useful. Uh, heavy bales in Cape Town are almost a necessity rather than a uh, luxury. And then a scissors or a nail clipper helps to cut any uh, strings or pieces of the ball that are falling off or becoming loose. And then op optional extras that you can fit into your pocket, a spike key. If uh, players' spikes come loose, you can help them to tighten their spikes. A ball gauge, Abdullah showed us how to use a ball gauge in our first lecture to make sure the ball is still in shape. And some umpires like to carry sweets on them for energy levels to be maintained throughout the day. So let's have a look at what some of these items look like. On the top left is a bowler's marker. On the bottom left, is a ball gauge. Top right is a clicker and the clicker at the bottom in red counts the balls bowled in an over and then the two numbers in yellow at the top count the number of overs bowled in the innings. Bottom right is what a spike key looks like 
and then in the middle is a picture of a bowling card. And uh, before the season starts, Western Province Cricket Umpires Association will have a refresher course, including an on-field practical. And in that on-field practical, we will show you as a new umpire how to fill in a bowling card. We've spoken about what you need to carry in your on your person on the field. Let's have a look at what you should have in your kit bag on any match day. You need to have a spare standing shirt in case at lunchtime you spill on your shirt. You need to have a five meter tape measure and a 30 meter tape measure. The five meter tape measure is to check the lengths of the creases and the 30 meter tape measure is to check if the fielding restriction circle for the limited overs matches is the correct measurement. Very good idea to have your law book in your hit bag. The first couple of years that I was umpiring, I used to carry my law book in my back pocket uh, as almost a uh, security for me. If players were to ask me any difficult questions, I could quickly have a look while I was at striker's end or during a drinks break. But um, the best place for your law book is to be kept in the kit bag, not on you with the on the field. You also need to have your playing conditions printed in uh, a book or a folder, whatever format you want, just to be able to refer to them and show any players or coaches that need clarification on playing conditions. Team sheets and captain's reports and violation reports, also good to have printed out. The captain's reports nowadays are filled in electronically on uh, Google Sheets that are submitted after matches, uh, but some leagues, we still don't use those electronic captain's forms. So always a good idea to just have a spare captain's report in your bag in case you need it or the captain needs it. Spare balls for the format of the match that you are playing in the league that you're playing. There will be specified balls for that particular game or tournament. Uh, make sure that you have a variety of balls to choose from if balls get lost or become out of shape during your match. At Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, the first T20 weekend of the season at the end of the matches on the Saturday and sometimes Sunday, the umpires will get to keep the match balls so that we all at least have one spare ball with us throughout the season. Sunscreen, very important. You need to protect your skin from the ultraviolet rays. I recommend um, 40 or even 50 factor for sensitive skin. Toilet paper is probably even more important than sunscreen. Some fields you might get to and there is no toilet paper in the toilet and you only realize that when it's too late. Optional extras that you can carry in your bag. Uh, eye drops. I use eye drops before every match and sometimes after every match. Uh, deodorant. You want to smell fresh for yourself and the players. Uh, lip balm also protects your lips from the sun. And if you have a dietary requirements which are different to what the club offers, then pack your own lunch. 
Here are pictures of a team sheet on the left and the captain's reports that we use at Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. I will send out this presentation to all of you uh, tomorrow morning, along with a, the link to the recording of this evening's lecture. This is what our violation report looks like. Hopefully you don't ever have to use these, but we are the gatekeepers of the law in any game and playing conditions. And if players step out of line, we need to report bad behavior um, according to the code of conduct or the code of behavior that Western Province Cricket Association has. Every competition will be guided by a different code of behavior. And law 42 in the law book is um, player behavior. And that is why we don't present it because the code of behavior differs from one association to the next and from one competition to the next. You need to be familiar with what the punishments are for specific offenses so that you record the offenses correctly and both of you as umpires involved in the match need to agree that you're going to report the player both sign on the report and um, where possible get the signature of the player who's been reported the least you can do is inform that player that you are reporting him or her um, before the end of um, the day, before you leave the ground after the match. Right, so let's get into pre-match duties and we start with the night before the match. You need to revise your playing conditions. You all know your laws now because you've gone through uh, Cricket South Africa's level one umpiring course and you've passed your exam in a couple of weeks time. But before your match, you need to read through the playing conditions of that particular match or that particular tournament because they do override the law. Make sure you get a good eight hours of sleep because you will need all the energy levels you can have for your long day on the park the next day. Confirm directions to the field if you're going to a field for the first time. We do have a WhatsApp group for Western Province Cricket Umpires Association umpires, and we do help each other with directions, with addresses, and with location pins for fields where necessary. It is very embarrassing as an umpire if you get to the field later than you're supposed to, and that usually happens when umpires get lost. So please make sure if you've never been to a field before that you give yourself enough time to potentially get lost, but still make it to the ground an hour before the match starts. Law says that you need to be there 45 minutes before the match starts, but in our playing conditions at Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, you need to be there an hour before the match starts. I mentioned an iron shirt. You need to iron all your clothing to look as neat and professional as possible and pack your bag the night before. Don't wait until the morning of the match to pack your bag because you will invariably forget to pack something. And then in the days where we still had to fill in physical captain report, um, I would fill mine out the night before. And there's just some of the information that I would put in. Uh, we don't have to do it now that um, uh, captains are filling in their reports online. But we do still have to fill in the match details on the team sheet before handing it to the scorers the next morning or the captains of the two sides. So now we arrive at the ground an hour before the match starts. 
And why we need to be there an hour before the match starts is because there are many things to do before the match starts. Let's go through some of the more important duties we carry out. It is good practice to wait for your partner before going out to inspect the field and measure the creases. Because you need to look like a team at all times. Hopefully you arrive at the same time. You get changed at the same time in the same changing room if you are not already in your standing attire. And then you go out onto the field to do your inspections together. In uniform. Collect your fully completed team sheets before the toss. Don't wait. Don't get to the toss and ask the captains, where are your team sheets? Make sure that they either you have their team sheets or when you see them walking towards you for the toss, they must have the team sheets in hand. So just remind them to bring their team sheets to the toss beforehand. Confirm that both teams have the correct match ball to be used. Um, typically, in our leagues, the teams are issued with match balls at the start of the season. And so they will have their match ball that they're going to bowl with. And you just need to confirm that they do have the correct ball. Because different competitions use different match balls, at least here in Cape Town. Agree the boundary and allowances for boundaries. We saw in an earlier lecture where there is a tree five meters in off the boundary at Peter Maritzburg Oval. The custom there is if the ball hits the tree, whether the ball had been rolling along the ground or it was flying far above the boundary, but hits the highest leaf on that tree, it is a boundary four, so you need to know any of the customs at that ground if there are any obstacles within the field of play or trees overhanging into the field of play. You need to synchronize your watches with your partner and your score and the scorers. Very important that you're all on the same page time wise. And are the wickets properly pitched. Make sure that a ball cannot go through between any two stumps and keep a spare stump by the scorers. If a stump gets broken during play, it will take way too long if a stump is not at the scorers to replace that stump. So a little bit of admin Pre-match saves you a lot of time during the match. Measure the creases, pitch length and fielding restriction circle if applicable. And you need to know those measurements to be able to measure them. Check that the side screens are in line if you do have side screens. Check where the covers are, where the roller is, and if it's a rainy day, or there's rain forecast, ask the ground authority if there is any sawdust available that you can use when required. If there are covers on the side of the field, make sure that they are dry. Even if there hasn't been any overnight rain, the covers might have gotten watered on when the sprinklers were on the night before. Make sure that the covers are dry so that a ball doesn't uh, roll onto the boundary rope and jump up into the wet spot on the cover outside of the field. Because a if a ball gets wet, the fielding side will be um, disadvantaged. Ensure that the covers are dry. We've spoken about that. And then 
to show the teams that you as umpires are a team and no umpire is more senior than the other one, you both need to speak at the pre-toss discussions with the captains. And some of the things that you do discuss with the captains are player behavior, uh, the overrates that need to be adhered to, and the uh, pace of play um, that needs to be adhered to. And if there are any new laws or playing conditions that are in effect for the first time this season, then you should explain those briefly to the two captains. Very importantly, no conversations about how the pitch might play and who should bat or bowl first with the captains at the toss. You can have such conversations with your partner in private, in your change room, or if you are alone at the pitch while measuring the creases, but do not carry that conversation over to the toss where the captains can hear you. Before calling play, if you're the bowler's end umpire to start the match, you need to check with the scorers, the score is ready. You need to check with your partner, Abdullah, ready. You need to check with the fielding captain, captain ready. And then you need to check with the batters at the crease if they are ready. And if everybody tells you or signals to you that they are ready, then you may put your arm down and call play. On the field, you need to make your decisions without fear or favor. And most importantly, enjoy the game. Otherwise, umpiring is not for you. I hope that gives you all a brief view of how to physically and mentally prepare for your day's play. And I hope that over the last six lectures, we've arisen some potential in you and passion for umpiring. I hope that you've learned a lot about the laws that you might not have known before. And we hope that after passing your exams, you will all be wanting to join the Umpires Association closest to you and start umpiring if you don't already umpire. And we will give all of those admin details in the seventh lecture, the revision lecture next week, Tuesday, as to how you can start umpiring after you pass your level one exam. So now we're going to go on to our question and answer session. And we're going to start the question and answer session by going back to our hit wicket dismissal. And we're going to ask Langton to talk us through it. Uh, before Langton talks us through it, I want to play it once more for all of you. And then all the way to the end where the umpire, the TV umpire makes the decision. And then I will hand the floor over to Langton to talk us through that decision in its entirety. Just bear with me while I close the match preparation presentation and reopen the presentation with the hit wicket dismissal. Okay, here we go. Law 35, hit wicket. And I'm going to play the entire clip all the way through until the dismissal, and then I will bring in Langton. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But that's what can happen when you're set and you think the pitch is behaving very nicely. End of the over. Now what has happened here? Well, has he, uh, has he uh, somehow touched the stumps? Uh, what's, what's going on here? One yeah, of the Brendan bills... Taylor, I think, after he's played the shot, has knocked the bails off with his bat. Now, I didn't see what was happening. I just heard it in my ear. And uh, Shaki Balasan has gone and uh, appealed to Maria Rasmus. So, discussion going on between those two men. Be interesting to see what happened here, actually. Well, he's just uh, checking with the uh, fielders. And we're not too sure, but the bails were off. One of the bail. Let's see what has happened. He's fine. It's a legal delivery. It'll be a big blow if uh, Brendan Taylor de departs in that fashion. Nothing, nothing, nothing. What does he do? Oops, that's gone. That's gone. He cannot believe his luck. I thought it's going to be his lucky day today. Unlucky second time around. <laughs> Confirmation. He just cannot simply believe his luck. <laughs> He was so far away from the stumps. In the end, it's just the bottom edge of the bat. It just hangs around, turns around, and just clips the bail off. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, at the bottom, I'm sure you can all see TV umpire Langton Rusere from Zimbabwe. Uh, that wasn't a hometown decision, Langton. Uh, what happened? Please talk us through it. Was it the correct decision or, of art, or was it uh, not the correct decision? Um, did you feel under pressure at the time? And how was the post-match debrief with the match referee after the game? The floor is yours, Langton. Uh, Langton, are you there? Please unmute your microphone. You seem to be on hold. Uh, uh, Tom, uh, just look in the chat box. It looks like there's a message from, from Langton. Okay. So it looks like he's not available at this time. So I think let's get okay. uh, back to this. Uh, he's, he's on the call with, uh, with someone. Okay, no problem. Thanks uh, for picking that up, uh, Dula. So we shall leave that for a little bit later. And we shall go to any questions in the chat box. I don't see any hands up currently. Um, Christopher Felix has got his hand up. Christopher, it went up then down. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, uh, Tom. J uh, just a quick one for me, RE the dead ball. Let's say the example that was uh, shown earlier by, I think, I can't remember, but the example earlier where uh, Jason Roy was given out for obstructing the field. When that ball is called dead, and let's say that was ball number four in the over, mm. when, when the bowler resume, will that, then, will that ball number four be uh, re -bowled, or do you carry on with ball number five? Uh, yeah, if you could just help me with that one. Good question, Christopher. Uh, you will have seen and you will have heard in that particular example, David Lloyd, the commentator, who actually used to be an umpire, he says they've called dead ball to sort this issue out. Remember in Law 20, when we went through dead ball, one of the times when you need to call and signal dead ball is when you are going to consult with your partner. So that is the only reason that the umpire called dead ball for that particular uh, scenario. 
Um, the question whether that ball counted as a delivery or not, I will throw that at uh, Abdullah. Uh, there are instances where a dead ball does count as a legal delivery, and there are instances where the ball needs to be re bowled if it has been bowled. Abdullah, you want to briefly take us through a few examples? Uh, uh, yes, Tom. So in so when it comes to the dead ball, there are two instances where the ball will not count as one for the over. The first one is when it comes to deliberate distraction, obstruction or deception of a batter. So even if that was ball was bold and the umpires together decide there was a willful, let's use let's say obstruction. Uh, then that ball will not count as one for the over. The ball then needs to be uh, rebuilt. So that is uh, when the deception or obstruction happens after um, the ball was faced or after the, the striker played at the ball. There's also a deliberate um, obstruction before, before the um, ball was bowled. In that case also, even if that ball was bowled, that ball also not to count as one for the over. So those are just two examples where even if the ball is bowled, you will call and signal dead ball. And in those instances, the ball will not count as one for the over and that ball needs to be uh, re -bowled. There are other instances as well. I mean, uh, player returning uh, without uh, permission. So as soon as the player touched the ball, umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. That's another instance where the law tell us that that ball will also need to be rebuilt. Illegal fielding is another example where the ball will also have to be rebuilt once illegal fielding uh, happens. So those are, uh, Chris, uh, four examples of when dead ball gets called, but the ball not to count as one for the over. Uh, over, Tom. Thanks, Tula. Happy with that, Chris. Thank you very much. I appreciate that response. You're welcome. Next hand up, Ankaj. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Hello. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, I have a question regarding stumped. I mean, it's not a question, but I just want to confirm whether my thinking is right or wrong. So let's assume a scenario where spinner baller is bowling and he bowled a normal legal delivery. So batsman went away from his popping crease. Batsman misses the ball. Then wicket keeper collects the ball and fairly breaks the wicket. But when wicket keeper collected the ball, he collected before it crosses the line of strikers wicket. And batsman didn't bother to come back to a return crease. He straight the batsman attempted a single run. So in that case, it will be a no ball and run out, correct? Because wicket keeper collected the ball before it crosses the line of striker's wicket, and batsman did not. Uh, I mean, batsman attempted the single run. Yeah. Abdullah, you want to take that one? Yeah, Pankaj, uh, let me just get confirmation that I'm visualizing uh, your scenario. So spinner bowling, better double steps, uh, misses the ball, but the keeper in eagerness to get to the ball takes the ball in front of the stumps and then removes uh, the, the bales. That's right. So, yeah, so then just take me further. Then what does the batter do? Uh, then batter didn't bother to come back to a pop increase. They just continue their run. The, the, did the batter attempt to take a run, Pankaj? That's right. Batsman attempted to take a run. Okay, so, so then Pankaj, because the batter attempted to take a run, in this instance, batter will now be given out a run out. Yes, uh, you cannot be stumped off a no ball. 
but you can be run out of a no ball. So because of the attempt by the batter to take a run, he now brings the run out law uh, into play. And in this instance, better to be given out a run out. Did I answer your question, Pankaj? Yeah, that's right. So it's a no ball and run out. Uh, correct. Yeah, the noble will always stand. So you'll signal noble to the scorers. You'll wait for them to confirm. Uh, the striker's end needs to give the better out uh, run out. Yeah, that's what I just wanted to make sure my understanding mm -hmm. is correct. Yeah, Thank you your so understanding much. is correct. Uh, thanks, Pankaj. And the key there, Pankaj, is that the striker attempted a run. If the striker did not attempt a run, as I described earlier, then the striker is not out stumped because he cannot be stumped off a no ball and is also not out run out because the striker was not attempting a run. But in your example, the striker was attempting a run, so no ball and run out. Happiness. Felix, you've still got your hand up. Is that an old hand or do you have another question for us? Christopher. Uh, I, I do have another question, if I may. Uh, Go ahead. Okay, uh, this one was, uh, and, and I hope it's fine, it's, it's based on one of the previous uh, lectures where we where it was discussed let's say the umpire miscounted the over and mm. it was said if it is brought under the attention of the umpire that this is now ball number seven and the over should be called mm. let's say that ball number seven is a no ball and the over is called will that no ball count in terms of the penalty run towards the score or not Abdullah, I'm going to give that one to you as well, please. Yeah, so Chris, anything that happens off that seventh ball, so yes, you've allowed a seventh ball, you should not, not have allowed a seventh ball, but anything that happens off that seventh ball will count. So a no ball will count. Any run scored off that ball will also count. If a batter gets dismissed off that ball, that will also uh, count. So then you realize you've allowed the seventh ball, but everything of that seventh ball will count. You will then subsequently uh, call over. Did I answer your question, Chris? Okay, thank you. So the only thing that will not happen is the ball to be rebuilt. So the that is the will only be, thing will be concluded yes. at seven, but anything that happens of that delivery will stand. Correct, Chris. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, copy that. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Are there any further hands up in the meeting room? Nope. I see uh, Langton is no longer on hold. Langton, are you available to talk us through the hit wicket or still not? Doesn't look like Langton is as yet. Let us take more hands in the meeting room. Najwa Omar is getting ready for her debut game with Abdullah. And Najwa, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. <laughs> evening, all, evening, Tom. Evening, Abdullah. Um, so I don't know if it's a question or it's just for my understanding. Um, the pre-match duties, it's a very informative and interesting um, set of um, things that you need to go through. But um, my question relates to Rule 40, the timeout rule that you mentioned earlier, Tom, um, where um, the batsman that comes in, um, he obviously got a three-minute rule, so I think I've got one question right in there for the exams the three minute rolling there. And as you said, you've got the exception where you got like in club games, um, where players use the same pads and stuff um, in the game. So the time when you do the pre-match duties, isn't that the question that can be posed to the captains? Because at the toss, where you can ask if there is anything like that, that is gonna obstruct or bring that role 40 into play. I don't know if I understand what I'm, I'm trying to say. 
Sure. Um, well understood, uh, Najwa. And uh, that is a uh, case of proactive umpiring, which we always encourage. Um, the thing about the toss is that you cannot sit and talk to the captains for two, five, 10, 20 minutes. Um, you want to keep it short and sharp. And the main point of the toss is to decide who is going to bat or bowl first. Uh, so yes, mm -hmm. we do try and address any pertinent issues, especially discipline, um, especially if you know that uh, the sides have some troublemakers in their midst. Um, you want to draw the line on the disciplinary issues there and then. Um, it is very rare that we get a team sharing pads. Uh, this happened to me in a game probably 10 years ago now. Yes, it would happen in the lower divisions if it were to happen. Um, but I think it's so rare that it's probably not something that I'm going to mention in a um, pre-match discussion at the toss. Um, unless I, I, I get to the ground and I see that the team is sharing one kit bag because usually uh, a team yeah. of 11 players, all of them will be pulling their kit bags when they walk into their change room. So if I do mm -hmm. see that, um, there is one kit bag for the entire team, then I will probably bring that up in the uh, toss conversation. Um, but it's not something that I would normally bring up. Uh, Abdullah, I'm not sure how uh, you, you would handle it. Exactly the same, Tom. You answered it perfectly. Okay, so for me, um, from this session, I can tell you guys the first match of the season is going to be very, very interesting. I don't think I'm going to watch the game, um, the guys playing, but more watching the umpire applying the laws and watching Abdullah applying the laws as what he is mentioning now. Yeah, that's uh, funny you mentioned that, Najwa. So as umpires, You'll, you'll notice, we don't watch the game. Initially, we watch the umpires, we watch their movements, we watch the, uh, the, you watch what they do. That is just, uh, mm. uh, you know, our umpires watch the game. First the umpires, and then we look at the rest of the game. I don't know about you, Tom, but <laughs> I think most umpires, almost all of us, we watch the umpires when, uh, when the game is going on. Yeah, so the first game, like I said, is going to be very interesting for me. But thank you, guys. Najwa, I, I hope that first game you will be on the field watching your partner uh, because... Uh, yeah, which will be Abdullah. Uh, it's going to be Najwa and Abdullah in that first game. So Najwa, looking forward <laughs> standing with you um, in the next few weeks. Our season starts first week of October. So I'm looking forward standing in October uh, with you, Najwa. Um, Abdullah, and I, I think you know my character. Um, I might be chirping at the bowler um, when he comes past. So it's going to be a bit. This is going to be a tough one, a tough cookie. Eh? <laughs> so, yeah, but all the best to the the fellow umpires on the um, the future umpires on the on the panel here, and thank you for giving us this platform. You're welcome, Najwa. Uh, thanks for joining us and uh, also giving input into the question and answer sessions. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Sentil. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Uh, Tom, I want to add one more thing is what Christopher is asked. If it is like uh, seventh ball, he asked him. For me, I'm asking in a different way. I don't. Just for the is is happened or any umpires, if the if the over is in the five balls only they have bowled. For example, whites and no balls it is there. The ball over is bowled more than six ball deliveries, but they have miscalculated both leg umpire and the main umpire, which means striker umpire and the bowler and umpire, and they have called us over. But legally it is bowled only five balls. Is this happened anywhere? Or if it is happened like that, what you will do? Is it over or even though we five balls only for bold? 
Good question, Sentil. Um, and the simple answer is the law actually says that the over is as the umpires have called it. So if the umpires call it incorrectly as five balls uh, given as an over, then unfortunately um, that will be the end of the over. And the scorers usually mark the sixth delivery as a dot because it didn't take place, but they need to have something in their book for every delivery. I had a game, a televised game at Newlands. It was the Cape Cobras against the Dolphins. And Abdullah was my television umpire. And um, myself and my on-field partner, after five deliveries, we called over and we walked from our positions to our positions for the next over. And that is when Abdullah came on the radio and uh, said, Tom, I have checked with the scorers. I have checked with the TV. I have counted myself on my sheet. Only five balls have been delivered. Please go back and bowl the sixth ball of the over. So even though we had called over, uh, law does allow us, remember, to change our decision. And we apologized to the players and we said, gentlemen, the TV umpire has confirmed that only five balls were bowled in that over. So we're going to go back to our positions and bowl the sixth ball of the over. If the next over had started by the next bowler starting their run up, then we would not have been able to go back. But because the next over had not started, even though us as umpires were in, in position for the next over, the next over had not started because the next bowler had not started the run up of the first ball of that next over. So we were able to go back. Um, Pankaj, I hope that answers your question. Sorry, that was central. Yeah. Uh, no, Tom, uh, just to add yeah, something Tom. to what you've just, uh, yeah, uh, central, just to add to what Tom has uh, said. So, yeah, um, in the game that Tommy uh, explained, yes, we had the luxury of, you know, of TV. So I could, uh, as the TV umpire, I could, I could triple check my records against the, the official scorers, again, also against the TV, uh, um, against the TV broadcaster. So I, I was able to confirm that only five balls were spelled. But at club level, we, all, we don't have that luxury. So it is important that you do get your counting spot on. It's a very important aspect of uh, umpiring, um, uh, especially in all formats, but especially in the in the white ball format, i.e. 20 uh, over cricket and 50 uh, over cricket. Um, but there will be times that you will make a mistake. So at club level, what I do is, so yes, I try to get my 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 counting spot on, but on the odd occasion where I'm not 100% sure, I look at my colleague and he or she is not 100% sure, uh, what I do is, yes, not ideal, and it doesn't look good, but I'd rather get to the correct decision at the end of the day because a ball can make a difference between a side winning and, um, and losing the game. So I actually stop the game for a few seconds. I then just ask one of the fielders, just, uh, the scorers usually sit uh, at the side of the field. Uh, I won't shout to the scorers, but I'll ask one of the fielders, just shout, ask the scorers how many balls remaining in the over. It takes literally 10, 15 seconds. The scorers will indicate there's one ball left or it's over, um, and I will then go, go accordingly. That is if uh, I'm unsure, my colleague is unsure, it literally takes you 10 seconds. Yes, it doesn't look good, uh, but... I'd rather have uh, um, that than make a mistake. Uh, you allow an extra ball uh, or don't allow an extra ball um, or you play a ball short, end of the game, uh, um, side lose by one or two runs, and now they're going to point fingers at the umpires didn't get the counting uh, correctly. That's why we uh, lost uh, the game. Over, Tom. 
Thanks, Lula. Uh, there's Thank a you question. so much, Abdullah and Rito. Thank you. You're welcome, Sentel. There's a question related to that in the chat box, and I think you have answered this before. What if the seventh ball in the over results in a wicket? Uh, the wicket will stand. If there's any runs, the runs will stand. Uh, if there's a no ball in the seventh ball and you realize that you've bowled seven balls, you will call over. OK, so you can um, correct that mistake at the end, but you cannot undo the mistake of the ball being delivered. Uh, patience, I hope that answers that question. Uh, just a bit of umpiring field craft. I think we did mention this in a previous lecture uh, when we were going through law 17, the over. But I'll just reinforce it because it's very important. Um, if there is a no ball or a dead ball or a wide ball in the over, or if a wicket falls in the over, that is usually when we tend to miscount in an over. So what we need to do is if there's any one of those incidents in an over, we need to confirm with our partner how many balls are left in the over. So if the first ball of an over is a no ball, there are still six balls left in the over. And the way we signal six balls left in the over is with a fist. So I'll show Abdullah, Abdullah, there's still six balls left in the over and Abdullah will um, show me his fist to confirm that he also believes there are six balls in the over. We're on the same page, six balls left in the over. We're on the same page and we shall carry on with the over. If a, a no ball is bowled in the uh, fourth ball of the over, then there are still three balls left in the over. And remember, I do remember showing you signs now that um, we show a line halfway on our waist level to show three balls left in the over. Uh, there, Abdullah is standing up and showing us how to signal three balls left in the over. Um, and we would confirm with each other that there are three balls left in the over. And we always, whether there's a legal delivery or not, we always show two when there's two balls left in the over. And then um, I like, if I'm at the striker's end, I like to, when there's one ball left, I write in my bowling card. So when Abdullah looks up at me from his position at bowler's end, he'll see me writing. That's the only time I write. He will know that I've got one ball left in the over. Uh, if I'm at the bowler's end and there's one ball left in the over, I will show Abdullah one ball left in the over. OK, so very important to agree these signals with your partner beforehand so that when I show Abdullah anything, he knows exactly what it is that I'm showing him. Uh, you can't show your partner a new signal on the field for the first time. He or she will not know what you're signaling to them. So in that way, you minimize the chances of miscounting and over. Pankaj, you've got your hand up again. Is that a old hand or a new question for us? Is yeah, it's a, it's, it's a question regarding the exam. Uh, you might have published this information, but I just want to know how do we pay for the exam? On the emails that I've been sending, Pankaj, about three quarters of the way down, uh, there is uh, two payment methods listed. For those uh, candidates who are in South Africa, they need to send an electronic funds transfer to a standard bank account. And to those candidates outside of South Africa, they need to send uh, 30 US dollars via PayPal. And you simply click on the PayPal logo on the email and it will take you to a page on our PayPal where it is uh, the account that you need to pay into. If you have subscribed as a um, subscriber on our YouTube page, uh, the exam fee is 30 US dollars. So Pankaj, have you received any of my emails? Yes, I'm receiving your emails. 
probably I might have, uh, I might not have looked into the email carefully. Yes, so it, it is about three quarters of the way down to the end of the email is all the payment details of the exam. And the deadline to pay for the exam is next week, Sunday, the 3rd of September, uh, 6 p.m. South African time. And I will go through all the um, logistics of how the exam works. And we, uh, on next week, Tuesday, I will go through a click by click demonstration of what, how to register for the exam, how to um, input your details for the exam, and then also how to start answering the exam. And it's all, all online, so you can do it in the comfort of your home, work, or um, anywhere you want to, really. I hope that answers your question, Pankaj. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to meet you and uh, Abdullah in person in Houston. Great, Pankaj, where are we going to meet you? Are you coming to South Africa or are you inviting us to where you are? No, no, no. I'm saying in Houston, in USA. Oh, oh, in like Houston. Cricket umpiring. <laughs> okay, the, the, there's a story behind that, Pankaj. We can't go into it right now. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll email you some details at a later stage, okay? Sure, thank you. Right. Um, Langton Rusiri, I see you're typing in the chat box. Does that mean you are available to talk to us? Um, are you done with your long conversation with Mr. Mike Gadger? Langton, are you available to talk or only to type? Looks like he's only available to type at the moment. Uh, so Langton, yes, to answer your question, uh, next week, Tuesday, Abdullah is going to take us through uh, revision slides, which will be all of the slides in the presentation, which have lime green text. For those of you who don't know, the lime green text is content that is examined in Cricket South Africa's level one umpiring exam. So we will use only those slides as a revision material next week, Tuesday. That'll take about an hour for us to get through. And then I will take you all through a click by click demonstration of how to register for the exam and how to input all of your details for the exam and how to start answering the exam. In fact, we will go through a, um, it's not level one, it's uh, the introduction to umpiring exam that Cricket South Africa also has online. It's 35 questions, true or false, and we will each have a chance to answer one of those 35 questions. And we will also show you what happens if you potentially run out of time when you are answering your questions for the level one online exam. For the level one online exam, you have got um, 69 questions which you answer in a maximum of 90 minutes. So what happens if you take more than 90 minutes? The system will end your exam and only mark those questions that you have attempted. Um, so we'll go through all of those logistics uh, via a demonstration next week, Tuesday. And I see uh, Langton will be trying to join us. I think you will already be in Pakistan. Um, but you might have an evening off to join us. That would be much appreciated, Langton. Uh, going back into the chat box, uh, let us see if there are any questions that we haven't yet answered. I see that uh, there were quite a few uh, not outs, but uh, there were also one or two outs for the hit wicket um 
appeal. So a very uh, contentious one and um, hopefully Langton is available to talk us through it at some point this evening. Uh, but if not, then I'll hand over to Abdullah to take us through it. And then the question from Tembeka reads as follows. On clothing wear, as a female umpire, is it allowed for me to have manicured, say maybe artificial nails in pink or whatever color of choice? Um, does that dent my image in any way? Uh, good question, Tembeka. Uh, I'll tell you a story about my own image. Um, I used to have dreadlocks back in the day when I started umpiring in 2007, and I had dreadlocks all the way until 2014. And uh, the national match officials manager of Cricket South Africa at the time, who was responsible for promoting club umpires to professional umpiring, uh, Mr. Carl Herter, at one of the um, elite amateur tournaments, Boys Under 19 Coca-Cola Week in 2013, um, in my one-on-one -on -one with him after the tournament, uh, where I was fortunate to end ranked first, he congratulated me on a very good tournament. And then he asked me uh, if I'm Rastafarian. And I said, no, I'm not Rastafarian. Uh, so then he said to me, then I need to cut off my dreadlocks. And I was very surprised as to why he would want me to cut off my dreadlocks because my dreadlocks were part of me and who I was uh, from 1999 all the way to 2013 at the time. And also the dreadlocks were covered by a hat whenever I was umpiring. Um, but his, his uh, message to me was that um, they don't look very neat, uh, they don't look very professional, and uh, have I ever seen any other umpire with dreadlocks? Um, so I thought about it for a while and I spoke to my wife about it and she said I should not cut my dreadlocks. So I had quite a, a difficult decision to make. Do I keep my wife happy or do I try and make my potential new boss happy? Uh, it took me a year and a half to make the decision to finally cut my dreadlocks. And um, coincidentally or not, um, as soon as I cut my dreadlocks, I progressed and was promoted onto Cricket South Africa's uh, national panel. Um, so it is a it is a tricky one. Um, I showed you a picture of Kumar Dharmasena and um, Alim Da, and they both looked neat and professional. And I told you that the easiest thing for umpires to get right is their appearance. And what we must also not do is draw attention to ourselves. OK, so uh, yes, I think you can paint your nails um, a, a nice color that you like, uh, but I think don't make it so flashy that the first thing that players notice about you are your pink, white, yellow, and bright green nails. Um, keep it one color and keep the nails um, short and not too flashy. That would be my um, advice to you. Uh, but we don't also want to get rid of people's individuality. So um, yeah, I wouldn't say no completely to coloring your nails. Uh, Abdullah, I don't know if you have any fashion advice to give Tim Becker as an umpire. <laughs> oh, I'm the last person to give any fashion <laughs> advice, according to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you've, you've covered it all, Tom. <laughs> OK, great. Um, looking through the rest of the chat box, a few greetings from uh, legends Reggie Barry and Mazizi Gampu. Uh, good to see uh, Sarah from Zimbabwe has also joined us. We've addressed the 
question by patience about the seventh ball taking a wicket. And it looks like the rest of the messages are all greetings. Uh, Reggie Barry, you were definitely with me in Durban, an unforgettable uh, Coke week that was. Uh, so, uh, Langton, it looks like you are still not available to chat to us. So I'm going to uh, throw the hit wicket uh, scenario to our deputy TV umpire tonight, Abdullah Stienkamp. Uh, Langton is not available to make that hit wicket decision. So I am sending it up to you, Abdullah. Uh, please take us through your protocols, your thinking, and what your final decision is on the Brandon Taylor uh, dismissal. And I will play it, uh, but with no sound, so that you can uh, talk us through that dismissal once again. Uh, yes, Tom. So before you play it, just keep it ready. I first want to just discuss what the law say with regards to eat the wicket and what facts we need to take into account when making our decision. And then I want you to play the video and then we're going to apply uh, the law uh, or these facts in uh, getting to our uh, decision. So eat wicket. I spoke about uh, earlier a window period. There's a period, there's a moment that it starts, and there's also a moment that the heat wicket ends. So when does it start? It starts when the uh, bowler's back foot lands, and it ends when the batter or the striker has completed any action in receiving the delivery. So it starts when the back foot lands, ends, when the batter has completed any action in receiving the delivery. Yeah, if I can if I can elaborate on what the law is trying to say in completed any action in receiving the delivery, uh, when the batter has completed the shot uh, in playing the delivery, when the batter has completed the shot that the batter was trying to play, once that shot is being completed, Completed, then the batter has completed the action in playing the delivery. So, Tom, let's start. Let's look at the clip. We're going to go through it slowly and we're going to apply the heat wicket laws and see what answer uh, we're getting. So, over to you, Tom. Thanks, Dula. I'm going to start it here as the yeah, bowler that, has yeah, entered that the is, delivery yeah. stride. Happy? Satisfied. Satisfied. Okay, if you can stop it there, Tom. I want you to yeah, freeze it there. So, if you look at the shot that uh, that uh, Brendan Taylor was trying to play, so to go back to the law, the law tell us uh, the uh, hit wicket law is done when the batter has completed any action in receiving the delivery. Another way of putting it, when the batter's completed the shot. So looking at the footage, what shot was Brendan Taylor trying to play? Brendan Taylor was trying to play a, a late cut over, over the slips. That was the type of shot that Brendan was trying to play. So looking at this particular clip and the shot that Brendan was trying to play, it was a late, uh, a late cut trying to hit the ball over the slips gully region towards third man. So now the question, looking at the shot, and if you now move it further, when is that shot completed? When is the scoop over, or the, the scoop that Brendan tried to play towards gully or third man completed? That is the uh, question that you need to ask yourself. So if you can now play it forward, Tom. Look at the shot, and now I want you to decide when that shot is completed. So there's the scoop. Now, now he does that. Is that what he's doing now? Is that part of the shot? That action that Brendan did there is, if your decision is that that's part of the shot, 
you need to give the batter out. If it's not part of the shot that Brendan was trying to play, that means he's, Brendan has completed his action in playing at the shot. So now if I can give you, so I'm TV umpire and, I, and so I'm applying the law. So my interpretation is that Brendan has completed the shot. This, uh, this action that Brendan's doing now is not part of this late cut that Brendan was trying to play over the gully or third man reason. So at this stage, according to me, my interpretation is Brendan is done with his shot. He has completed the action in playing at the shot. So the law tells us once the, uh, the batter, the striker has completed the action in playing uh, at the ball, that's when the window period stops. Anything that happens after that is now irrelevant. So my interpretation is that late cut over third man, Brendan is now done with the shot. So now if you move it forward, Tom, so now these actions, so now it's completed the shot. So for me, anything now that happens afterwards, the window period has closed now. So this action where he now puts the, the bat back and yes, he dislodged the belts, completed the shot. It wicked window period is closed. Hence, if I was TV umpire, I would have given this not out with my reasoning as I've just explained. Completed the shot. Shot is done. Action completed. Um, this uh, action where you now took the bat in the left hand and lazily uh, dragged it behind his body and accidentally knock, knocked off the bail. Uh, that is just, I don't know why he did it, but I will ignore it. Because shot is completed, action is done, window period closed for it wicket. That's why Brennan Taylor, I would have given Brennan Taylor not out it wicket. Over, Tom. Thanks, Dula. I think just to add to your uh, very thorough explanation, um, most shots do have follow throughs and that follow through is part of the shot or is to be considered as part of the shot uh, according to law. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this is as much of a follow through as that particular uh, uppercut scoop, I think they call it. Um, this here, you can see he's disappointed that he's missed the shot. This is no longer part of the follow through. The shot and the follow through has been completed uh, even before this particular freeze frame. So I do agree with you that um, the shot has been complete, completed and that uh, the decision should have been um, given not out hit wicket. Um, I'm going to give one last shout out to uh, Langton if he's here and available uh, to talk us through the post-match uh, debrief about that decision. Uh, Langton, if you are able to unmute your microphone and chat to us, please do so now. Uh, he's not doing so. So uh, I will give feedback as to um, what was said. Um, and of course, this is what we need to realize is that this is an opinion law. Uh, same as leg before wicket, where we need to decide, is the ball going on to hit the stumps if it wasn't for the interception of the pad? Uh, that is an opinion of the bowler's end umpire to decide on. And uh, similarly, whether the striker has completed his actions of receiving a delivery is an opinion for the strikers and umpire to decide on when adjudicating a hit wicket um, appeal. And in that time, at that time, making that decision, uh, Langton thought that Brandon Taylor had not completed the act of receiving that particular delivery. Uh, upon further interrogation and uh, review, um, he admitted to uh, making an error in that decision and he um, he learned from that incorrect decision. And I can tell you now that if any hit wicket appeal comes, Langton is excited to take it on 
to use his learnings to make the correct decisions going forward. Uh, so please, ladies and gents, uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes, but make sure that when you do make mistakes, you learn from the mistakes and you do better when you get the opportunity to um, adjudicate on a similar decision. Um, so I hope you've all learned from that uh, mistake. Langton did say that he hopes that the candidates today will learn from the mistake that he made so that one day when they get the similar appeal, uh, they don't make that same mistake. Um, so I think the great point to leave this lecture on would be to read uh, the message from Langton. He says, I've enjoyed learning with all the participants here. I'm honored to have such an opportunity to share and learn with this group. Tom and Abdullah are incredibly knowledgeable. Thank you so much, Langton. Uh, we hope to see you for the last uh, lecture on Tuesday. Um, if not, we understand you will be on duty and we wish to take this opportunity to wish you all the best going forward for your umpiring career and also um, stay as humble as you are, but keep reaching for the stars because at your age, uh, the sky is the limit in your umpiring career. Uh, to everybody else, this is possibly the start of your umpiring careers. I hope you've enjoyed these six lectures and we will reconvene on Tuesday next week. Same time, same place, different uh, meeting link, which I will share with you on Monday. Until then, keep well, stay safe, Thank you and good night. Thanks, everyone. And Essie, we expect some questions from you uh, on Tuesday next week, please. <laughs> I will, Tom. Thanks a lot. I've been enjoying all the lectures. But definitely, Tom, Abdullah, Tuesday, I've got some questions. Awesome. Looking forward to the MNSC. Take care. Cheers. Right.